So, uh, I showed you a little piece before about uh, perception and, and uh, where magicians and illusions connects with psychology and with some of the hardwired things uh, in your mind that magicians don't have to do very much in order to make happen. I'm going to show you another one of these uh, ideas that was first made uh, famous by uh, the late Jerry Anders, a dear friend of mine. Um, and uh, here's the idea. I'm going to show you something odd here. And um, I want you to... Uh, I want you to look at the spiral for the next little while. And uh, don't be distracted. Don't look away. You will join New York City skeptics. You will. <laughs> uh, keep looking into the spiral. In a few moments, I'm going to count down from 10. Please keep looking into the spiral. Uh, don't look at me. Look into the spiral. In a few moments, I'm going to count down from 10. And when I reach zero, I will ask you to suddenly look away. Don't do it now from the spiral to my face, but keep looking at the spiral. 10, nine, not yet, eight, seven, six, look at the spiral, five, four, three, two, one, look at my face. <laughs> Cool, huh? <laughs> uh, okay, now I'm going to show you a little variation on this. And what I need you to do is I need you to choose a partner that you are going to look at one another in a moment, okay? And so the reason I need you to work this out in advance is because otherwise the people on the aisles end up with a problem. So the aisle people will look in at the person next to them, and then you just, just, just decide amongst yourselves very, very quickly who is going to look at one another? You don't, doesn't mean you're engaged, doesn't mean, you know, another hour or so, you'll never see each other again. It's all fine, okay? So uh, now you're, you've chosen your partners. Once again, we'll, have, we'll let you look into the, the spiral. Please look into the spiral. Don't look away. Look into the spiral and don't look away. You will join the New England Skeptic Society. You will join. Uh, um, so look into the spiral, look into the tunnel, see the light. And uh, in a moment, when I count down from 10, this time, you will turn and look directly at your partner uh, on zero. 10, 9, look into the spiral, 8, 7, don't look away yet, 6, 5, 4, 3, Two, one, turn and look at your partner. You see it? No? Yes? How many saw it? How many saw it? How many saw it? It's the minority, really? I'm going to try one more time. I'll try one more time. This, in, instead of looking at the partner, look up at me. Look up at me at the end, okay? Just look into the spiral. I don't want to waste this because it's a different, it's a little bit different, okay? So look into the spiral, into the spiral, into the tunnel. Go to the light, Luke. Go to the light. Into the spiral. A few more moments. Don't look away. Don't, don't, look, don't turn away. Don't look away. Don't break it up. Stay looking into the spiral. Ten. Nine. When I get to zero, you'll look at my face again, but not now. Eight. Seven. Keep looking in the spiral. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. One, look at me. Oh, you got it that time? <laughs> right? Okay, so there you go. A little, uh, little lesson in perception. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, and this is why in the history of the skeptical movement, you know, we have academics, we have scientists, we have educators. Uh, researchers, critical thinkers, and you know, usually at least one magician for novelty. <laughs> All right, so for our uh, afternoon.
panel here, our second panel. Uh, let me introduce our moderator to you. Michael Dodora Jr. is executive director of the Center for Inquiry New York City, CFI NYC. Uh, Michael graduated from SUNY Albany in 2005 with a BA in Rhetoric and Communication and is currently pursuing a master's in poli-sci at Brooklyn College where he focuses on the intersection of politics, science, religion, and philosophy. Uh, prior to joining CFI, Michael worked as a writer and editor for City University of New York and also admits to having worked for Fox News. Uh, I asked him how many years would be required on the karmic scale to balance that out. Uh, he's not sure he can see that far into the future yet. Please welcome Michael Dodora Jr. Michael. Good job. Can everyone? Wow. Can everyone hear me? Fantastic. So I'm working on that karma thing, although I think I have a long, long way to go. And I surely can't see into the future, so um, that limits. That some wireless network thing just came up here. No, I don't want that. Um, all right, so uh, Jamie already told you that I'm the executive director of the Center for Inquiry in New York City. Uh, for those of you who don't know what the Center for Inquiry is, we're a think tank that advocates for the scientific outlook, among a bunch of other different things. Um, and the New York City branch is the local branch, although we're actually located uh, up in Buffalo. So, um, the topic of this afternoon panel discussion is why, it's, why is it so difficult to be a skeptic? Um, when the New York City Skeptics President Michael Feldman approached me about being a moderator for the panel, I thought, well, this one's pretty easy. Skepticism doesn't pay very well. <laughs> um, but alas, you know, perhaps it only counts for those of us who work professionally as skeptics or those who would like to work professionally as skeptics, although I would say keep in mind that it doesn't pay very well if you're thinking about doing this as a career. It is a heck of a lot of fun though. I mean, I get to address a crowd of, of maybe 400 people right now and that's extraordinarily exciting considering uh, I am only 26 years old, so. Um, so no, really, I, I started thinking why is it so tough for human beings to be skeptical about claims and knowledge? Um, there are of course myriad reasons and the, the panel uh, that we will have in a few moments will try to cover some of those. Um, but perhaps I can offer you know, some thoughts before the panelists and, and people who are much smarter than me take over. Um, so one, I think, is surely that life is enormously busy and stressful and there's so much information out there. I mean, the, the, the internet and computers are great things, but you really have to know how to use those to access good information. Because you can go to Wikipedia and think that you're reading something that's good, and it could be, I mean, you really have to go all the way to the bottom of the Wikipedia article to look at where the source is, and now you have to track down the sources, and you have to see where those sources come from. So there's not enough information out there, you just have to be aware of what the good information is and what the bad information is. Um, at the same time, I was just back in the green room, which has turned actually into a nursery room. There are like four babies back there. I'm stepping over babies, there's one crying behind me, I don't know what the heck's going on. Now, try raising a kid, and, and at the same time, you know, taking an interest in the recent healthcare debate. The, the recent healthcare bill is a thousand pages long. Our lawmakers aren't even reading this, and now you want someone who's raising a kid or two to sit down and really know what's going on in the healthcare debate. We have to depend on, on certain people for certain information, but it, it doesn't make the process very easy. A second factor, surely, is that emotions play a strong role in the human condition. So, um, some of the things that Paul Offit and Skeptics Guide to the Universe podcast were talking about before um, were the anti-vaccination movement. Surely we can understand here uh, the emotions that parents of autistic children and the emotions of parents who are thinking about uh, vaccines. We can surely understand the emotions that they're going through. This, this is a very stressful time in their lives. They're bringing up children that they love. Um, but at the same time, that doesn't give rise you know, to the credibility of the claim. It just shows us how strong emotions actually play a role in, in decision making. Um, I think the, the other thing that I would just point out is that, um, and this is a, a harder thing to really uh, tackle, but uh, think about dogma and uncritical adherence to ideology. Um, one perfect example of this would be the Obama birthers movement. Um, we have journalists literally waving Obama's birth certificate on TV. We have them printing it, and yet, the birthers are not budged by this whatsoever. Uh, they, they are in, in their stance and they are not budging whatsoever. Um, so 
you know, all of these things make it difficult for, or, or at least are symptoms of, of the, you know, lack of critical thinking skepticism within, within society, which in my estimation makes our jobs, not just the people who are doing this professionally, but everyone in this room, makes our jobs all the more important. We are, to some extent, a small community. Um, but we're a growing community, and while we continue to grow, I think uh, at the same time, we need to go on, you know, just literally destroying bad ideas wherever we come across them, and realize that these are bad ideas that are actually held by a majority of society. I mean, our, our jobs are enormously important. This is not something that we can just pass by and say, well, this is something I do as a hobby. Um, it, it doesn't matter if you don't do skepticism as a full-time job. Skepticism is a full-time job in terms of your cognitive outlook on life. Um, and I think in the face of all of this, we need to not, con you know, really make sure that we don't confine our skepticism to this room or to the back of a bar or to the local public lecture that you go to in, in your local towns. Um, like I said before, we actually need to carry on our lives as good, productive, you know, exemplary citizens, destroying and crushing those bad ideas where we, where we come across them. And at the same time, think of skepticism as a positive thing, whereas we are providing uh, more clear concise truth or truths to society. I mean, this is not something we just go around debunking ideas, but we're actually making information and ideas clear to the general public. With all that being said now, let me introduce this afternoon's Bad Idea Destroying Panel. There we go, yeah, all right. I, I clearly need to work on my snapping ability. Um, panelist closest to me is Massimo Pigliucci. Massimo is a professor of philosophy and chair of the philosophy department at the City University of New York, Lehman College, which is located in the Bronx. His research is concerned with philosophy of science, the relationship between science and philosophy, and the relationship between science and religion. He received a doctorate in genetics from the University of Ferrara in Italy, a PhD in botany from the University of Connecticut, and a PhD in philosophy from the University of Tennessee. So he has a few PhDs. It's, it's kind of embarrassing for me to hang out with him. But. <laughs> He's also published over 100 technical papers, uh, several books, has columns in the magazines Philosophy Now and Skeptical Inquirer, which is one of the Center for Inquiries magazines, actually. And. I mean, Richard Wiseman's talking about 59 seconds. I can surely talk about skeptical inquiry really quickly, all right? Um, and Penn's Rationally Speaking, a, a blog uh, that he updates twice a week. Um, he also has a, a book coming out in the spring, which is called Nonsense on Stilts, How to Tell Science from Bunk. That's our first panelist. Uh, yeah, we can Next to Massimo is Kaja Perina. Kaya. Kaya Perina, I, I apologize. She okay. corrected me actually That's in the okay. green room. You, but you and 80% of the world, so no problem. I'm going to blame it on all the babies that were back there, but it's <laughs> what I'm going to go with. Um, I love babies, though. I, I have nothing against babies. <laughs> I just want to get that out there. Too late, I'm, I'm hearing in the back. Uh, I won't be asked to Nexus next year. Um, Kaya Perina has served as editor in chief of the magazine Psychology Today since 2003. Prior to joining the magazine, she was a writer for Brill's Content. She has also worked for Vo uh, Vogue, the Associated Press, and Independent Television News of London. Her writing for Psychology Today is anthologized in the Best American Science Writing Series, and she also has a blog that can be found on the Psychology Today website, or at least blog posts on a blog on the Psychology Today website. Um, she is a lifelong student of human behavior who holds degrees from Vassar College and the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. And <laughs> And you already know him, but all the way uh, to my uh, right over here is, is Professor Richard Wiseman. Um, and, but I guess now we'll get kind of a full bio for, for Richard, if you haven't heard of him. <laughs> It's a good question, one I'd like to kick off on. <laughs> time out, time out. No, no, no. We're not going there. We're not going there. 59 seconds. It's out in January, yes. 
Uh, Professor Richard Wiseman started his working life as an award-winning professional magician and was one of the youngest members of the Magic Circle. He then obtained a first-class honors degree in psychology from University College London and a doctorate in philosophy, I'm sorry, a doctorate in psychology from the University of Edinburgh, right? Edinburgh. Edinburgh, Edinburgh, I'm sorry. And I was up like until 4 a.m. reading these bios over and over again. I'm sorry? You don't like Scots either. No. I like Scotch though, I don't know. Uh, for the past 12 years, uh, Richard has been the head of a research unit at the University of Hertfordshire. Oh, very good. <laughs> and in 2002, he was award, uh, awarded Britain's first professorship in the public understanding of psychology. Professor Wiseman has established an international reputation for his research into unusual areas of psychology, including deception, luck, and the paranormal, and wallets. Thank you, Richard Wiseman, for being here. Um, so before we get started with opening remarks, I just wanted to kind of go over the format of the panel very, very briefly. Um, I've already introduced the speakers. Now they will make kind of eight to ten minute opening remarks about the topic at hand. And then we're going to jump right into question and answers because we always find that that's the, the best part uh, of the uh, panel discussion. So the only thing I would say is that when you do come up to ask questions, keep in mind that there are people behind you, you know, be ethical human beings. Um, and try to keep your questions short, to the point, concise, and all that. So, um, starting uh, with the opening remarks will be Massimo Pagliucci. All right, thanks, Michael. Who apparently will be reading his opening remarks from the iPhone. This might be a first. I won't read the remarks, but I want to make sure I don't miss anything. Okay. And thanks all for right. not mispronouncing my name, by the way. <clears throat> <laughs> Which 80% of people do. Um, um, all right, so. <laughs> anyway, I don't, I don't, all right. So why is it so difficult to be a skeptic? Um, it's a good question because it's not difficult for me at all. I, have, I must have it in my genes. And, and so the, the first answer might come to mind as, as a former biologist is, well, maybe, maybe it's just in your genes and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, but, but since we want actually something to discuss, I'm going to propose a different thesis. I think it's actually, there's, there's at the very least three issues here. One is the psychological aspect of being a skeptic or engaging in skeptical thinking. One is, the, is a cultural aspect and then there is an educational aspect. Since we have two psychologists right next to me, I'm going to skip the first one and, and there will be plenty of time, obviously, to get to that part of the issue. So I'm going to talk about the cultural aspect and the educational aspect. From a cultural perspective, I'm sure it won't come as a shock to you to know that it is simply not cool to be a skeptic. There are exceptions. The skeptics, of course, is one of them. Um, but precisely because, yes, because, precisely because they're an exception, you can tell immediately. You know, if you present somebody, if you introduce yourself to somebody and say, what are you all? Well, I'm a skeptic. That's a dead end in terms of conversations. You're automatically assimilated to a cynic, to somebody who says no just for, you know, Groucho Marx had a great little song that says, whatever it is, I'm against it. And that, and that is what skeptics are presented to the public, are understood by uh, the public to be. So it's just not cool to be a skeptic, unfortunately. Why is it that, why is that the case? Uh, the, the answer to that is very complicated, obviously, but at least part of the answer goes back to several streaks of anti-intellectualism that have marked the history of American society since its inception. Uh, this is something that sociologists that actually have actually looked at um, for many years. Uh, the classic book in that, in that regard is Richard Ofstadter's um, on, uh, on American anti-intellectualism. And Ofstadter identified three kinds of anti-intellectualism, and I'm sure you'll recognize all three of them as soon as I mention them. The first one is anti-rationalism. Anti-rationalism, the idea that um, rationality is overrated, that, and at the same time that it's missing important components of, in, in life. Ration, uh, rationality as opposed to emotions, for instance. Uh, you know, the, 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 the Spock version of skepticism, that uh, we're all people who absolutely have no emotions, don't want to deal with emotions, and we're all about rational thinking, and uh, we've been perfectly good company with Sherlock Holmes, but nobody else. The idea of anti-rationalism has been around for a long time, and it has affected the way in which a lot of people um, think about skepticism. The second one is anti-elitism. This idea that if you're smart, you're automatically a part of an elite, and elitism is bad. Now, the interesting thing about American culture is that that is about the only type of elitism that appears to be bad. Right? <laughs> 
because this is a culture that is awash with celebrities, which is a kind of elitism. Uh, we have sports figures that we worship, or someone of us worship, and that's a kind of elitism. Of course, we have political um, figures, we have business people that we um, absolutely, you know, uh, keep in very high esteem, um, very high regard. That's, those are all kinds of elitism, if you want to put it that way. The only one apparently that, that rubs people the wrong way is the uh, intellectual one, in which Avstadter spends quite a bit of time talking about. The third one is um, also very typical of American culture, and it's unreflective instrumentalism, which is a really fancy word to say that if it doesn't matter in practice, it doesn't matter. Right? If you can't make money out of it, if you cannot um, turn it into the bottom line, then it's not important. And of course, if there is one thing that at least immediately you can't turn into bottom line is basic research, it's, it's philosophy, it's, it's uh, critical thinking. In the long run, maybe, perhaps, but it doesn't really translate into dollars um, immediately. And so that's the idea behind unreflective instrumentalism. Those are the three kinds of anti-intellectionists that Aufstadter identified. And then there is a, f a fourth one that is much more recent in nature, and then it's kind of a bizarre one because it comes from within academia itself, and that's postmodernism, at least some versions of extreme postmodernism. So these are people who essentially claim that um, nobody really can make truth claims uh, because uh, every, every kind of intellectual activity is just a matter of humans agreeing on a particular thing. So science, for instance, is no better than astrology, say, for the simple reason that science is what scientists agree it is. Uh, this is, of course, bogus. As a former scientist, I can tell you it doesn't work that way. You don't, there is no cabal of scientists sitting around the table deciding what's true and what is not true. Uh, but it, is, uh, it has had a very important impact, even at the political level, uh, in this country over the last 10 or 15 years. We have examples, of course, in the media of, of anti-intellectualism. And the obvious example uh, is some, some outlet for which Michael actually, I don't know if he told you in the introduction, but worked for. <laughs> known as Fox News, believe it or not. <laughs> not his fault. Everybody has to make a living. And he's, he's redeeming himself now. But if you look at the media, again, the landscape is, is really um, um, abysmal in terms of anti-intellectionism. I mean, Fox is the obvious culprit, but it's not like a lot of other media outlets. If you spend some time, for instance, watching CNN, which is still, by many people, uh, considered a reputable source of news, it's really abysmal. It's, it's, it, you are aghast with, what, at the end of the day, what you're looking at there. There are the occasional bright spots, like bullshit, for instance, you know, the Penn and Teller show. Or the Daily Show with John Stewart, which if you if you live in New York, you're you're lucky enough to actually be able to see live um, after a few months that you get on their mailing list. Now, the interesting thing about that, however, is that it seems to me that a lot of the interesting and positive intellectual discourse in this country over the last few years is done by magicians and comedians. <laughs> And, you know, as much as I like Penn, Taylor, and John Stewart, I don't think that's a good reflection on society, on our society. So we need to make skepticism cool. We need to make, make it interesting for a very important reason. Noam Chomsky, uh, some time ago, said that the fundamental thing about a democracy is that its citizens have to engage in a, intellect, in a course of intellectual self-defense so that they're not taken advantage of by their employers, by their politicians, by the media, and so on and so forth. Which brings me to the second point. In, in, incidentally, that is exactly the title of the course that I'm teaching now at CUNY, um, Short Course in Intellectual Self-Defense. And that brings me to education. The problem with education is that critical thinking courses are not taught until the college level, and even when they're taught, they're certainly not required. A lot of students go through an entire four-year curriculum in college and never heard of critical thinking. Okay. This is simply unacceptable. But even that, um, it's not enough. Even if we did make that kind of course mandatory, for, exa for example, I don't understand why a scientist or a medical doctor can get away with graduating without having taken a course in critical thinking. And this is just, uh, it, it blows my mind. But the problem is, in fact, that we're seeing a, sort of the opposite trend where liberal arts education is, has been under attack for many years at this point. And I, I suspect, I don't want to be too paranoid or, uh, or uh, like 
Chomsky, for instance, who has been accused of being paranoid, but his, I think his suspicion is correct that one of the reasons liberal arts education has been under attack is simply because it is a direct threat to both corporate and political interests. You don't want a smart citizenry. You don't want citizens who actually have taken that course in intellectual self-defense because they might start asking questions and they might start asking probing questions and insist on them. So instead, however, what I have as a, as a suggestion is even more radical than just making critical thinking courses mandatory at the college level. Or even I heard this morning in the, during the podcast somebody mentioned at the high school level. That, that would be a pretty good beginning. But I think that it should be made mandatory at the kindergarten level. There's absolutely no reason. As soon as children who are by nature very curious start asking questions, don't give them bullshit answers. Teach them. Teach them how to find out the answers. Uh, it can be done at the proper level. It's not that critical thinking is something um, uh, that, that should be done so only at the college level. Incidentally, that would be, of course, from my perspective, a great stimulus package for philosophers, for unemployed philosophers, because <laughs> in my, in my, my reckoning, at least we will employ at least 100 um, times more philosophers than we have now, and that can't, that can't hurt too much. Those are my remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Maso. start by sharing with you an um, email that I received recently from one of my most intelligent family members, um, which is of course to say that all my family members are intelligent. And she said to me, um, look at these anagrams. She sent me a bunch of anagrams and she was, she was shocked and really intrigued by them. And she found out that, for example, George W. Bush translates into he grew bogus. <laughs> now, lest one think that this is a coincidence, she also told me that the full name, George Herbert Walker Bush, can be rewritten as huge berserk rebel warthog. <laughs> Okay, so she, saw, she thought this was nothing short of prophetic. Now, I immediately dashed off to her, uh, you know, something of a screed about how, uh, about the Barnum effect, the idea that even the vaguest of information can be taken to refer very directly to us personally, the idea, Barnum's idea that, he ha that there's something for everyone out there. Um, you know, I gave her a little lecture about how we all have biases that, that make us favor our names to begin with and certain, and even the random reorganization of letters in this case that are our names. But I have to confess that as I was giving her this little scientific lecture, I had a, naggly, a, a niggling irritation. And that is because on this list of anagrams, she had included my own name. Now, my name is Kaya Perina, and that's a silent J, as Michael learned to his distress recently. <laughs> just, kid just kidding, Michael. Um, Kaya Perina, apparently, is, quote, a jerk, a pain. <laughs> so, okay. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I was that bothered about it, but Clearly, I was on some very unconscious level. Um, so the, 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 the three points I want to briefly make today pertain to appropriate skepticism. We all know it's easy to be skeptical. Um, we know people who, are who have no problem being skeptical about everything. I would call those people conspiracy theorists, in fact. They don't believe anything they hear. They don't believe anything uh, they read with their own eyes. Um, but, I, but I want to try to define appropriate skepticism. And I am going to refer to some notes. From now on, though, having seen Massimo, I think I will be referring to an iPhone. Um, but let's say, okay, why is it so hard to be appropriate, appropriately skeptical? Why was I... Why was I, you know, lambasting these anagrams with one hand and yet still slightly 
irritated, on the other hand? Well, we have cognitive biases that cause us to infer patterns and entities that don't exist. In other words, we commit a lot of type one errors. And this is something that Massimo has blogged about and written about quite a bit, most recently on ration, your blog, Rationally Speaking. So very briefly, um, to illustrate a false positive, if I'm walking through a forest and I get hit on the head with a coconut, should I assume it's just a chance occurrence, the result of the wind, or do I assume it's a predator or an enemy lurking in the trees? Well, okay. I may be preaching to the converted here, but let's just review the trade-offs of each, of each approach. The risk of falsely assuming a person is, is at hand, a false positive, is paranoia. I'm worried about something that is not there. The risk of the false negative is that I miss a mortal threat. Well, I think we all know that it's better to worry about the imaginary than to miss the obvious, and the paranoia is worse than death. So this inherent, this inherent bias, this tendency to make type one errors and over infer agency, um, makes skepticism a really difficult frame of mind to maintain. We've evolved to seek patterns, not randomness, agency, not inert matter. Now, for this reason, skepticism is tough even for self-proclaimed skeptics because our nature, and by self-proclaimed skeptics, I mean people who are appropriately skeptical, people who are skeptical about some of the subjects that we've been discussing today, you know, people who understand how to read medical information, people who, who will get their kids vaccinated, people who do not believe that, that Obama was born, that, you know, Obama is not an American citizen. So you can be appropriately skeptical um, and still become complacent in your thinking and decision making once you've developed a, cert once you've developed a heuristic. Um, because our default, quite simply, is to find a pattern and stick to it. And we can be appropriately skeptical until confronted with something that matters very much to us, and that's where we get into trouble. Um, you know, think love, think the lottery. The things that matter to us are the things that we will automatically put on blinders to view. Even appropriate skeptics can resort to magical thinking under duress. A recent study found that people exposed to annoying stimuli start to see patterns in random data, patterns that, you know, well, it's random, patterns that simply are not there. Obviously, this makes sense on one level, because the more threatening our environment, the more pressure we're under to lower the threshold for alarm, for false positives, and the more vigilant and paranoid we become. Now, I've been thinking a lot about appropriate skepticism in the past, in terms of the internet, these past 24 hours, because we have a blogger, um, one of our most read bloggers, had his most popular ever post yesterday. And this post was about, of all things, the photograph of Joe Wilson during, during Obama's speech this past week. Now, you may recall that, the, that everybody's seen the photo, everybody knows the story, Joe Wilson yelled out, liar. And there is a photo of him in mid-exclamation mid at a moment when the two people, the two men to his left and right have not even turned to look at him. So our blogger, Satoshi Kanazawa, raised one question, raised a simple question, and it was actually a tongue in it was partly a tongue in cheek query, and that is, how could a photographer in, a, in this hall of 535 plus people have, been, have captured a shot of Joe Wilson at this very second? Well, he, wasn't, he didn't even invoke conspiracy anything. But he posted, he posted an innocent sounding question and within, within a couple hours, there were tens of thousands of people discussing this all over the internet. Basically, you had people, you know, you had people saying Joe Wilson did it because he needs, Joe Wilson needs, needs to raise his reputation. Joe Wilson was trying to detract from Obama. This was all orchestrated. The photographer had been tipped off. 
And then you had the photographers and many, including the photographer's brother weighing in and giving the technical, the technical side and the fact that this actually could happen very easily. Okay, so this, country, this has gone on and on and on and it's now the most popular, the, the most read blog post we've ever had in the first 24 hours. So, how does this relate to appropriate skepticism? Well, I would like to suggest that Maybe, uh, you know, you might say that the people who explain the photo as a simple function of technology and luck, who have the seemingly parsimonious explanation, are the ones who are being appropriately skeptical. On the other hand, is, isn't our blogger who says, hey, what are the odds of getting this shot, and therefore engenders this whole controversy, also asking an appropriate question, you know, I mean, an appropriately skeptical question. To the extent that skepticism implies not simply believing your own eyes, as I said earlier, not taking things at face value, um, I think you can sometimes argue that the person who sounds a little paranoid, just a little, but nonetheless does sound paranoid, um, who asks the off-the-wall question, is in fact being appropriately skeptical. And, you know, another point to be made about this little tempest in a teapot, which I guess is a big tempest if you're, if you're watching Psychology Today's traffic, um, which I of course am, is that invoking conspiracy of any sort, however lightly, does strike a chord with people. I mean, this guy's been blogging for years, and his most non-scientific blog, unfortunately, and this goes to what we've been discussing about, uh, throughout the afternoon about scientific literacy, you know, a throwaway post by our most popular blogger becomes his most read item ever. So, perhaps that perhaps that's better left to the to the media panel. However, um, I will just conclude by saying um, one thing about maintaining a skeptical frame of mind. As you mentioned, Michael, in your intro. Um, emotions and not cold empirical thought are really the key to, to remaining analytical and rational on a day-to-day -day basis. The problem is that anything you care about, you're going to get worked up about, whether that is Obama's health care plan or your husband's allegedly terrible plan to remodel, remodel the bathroom. And when you're angry and when you're worked up isn't, is precisely the time to employ skeptical training because as many of you know, emotions often completely bypass reasoning. Emotions are meant to make us act, not think. They're designed to elicit blind, not the, not the truth per se, but blind allegiance to our needs and drives. So I guess skepticism to me is something that we do, not something that we are in the sense that you know, one can have read John Allen Paulos, one can have read Bertrand Russell, and still be extremely sus subject to gullibility, especially under duress, and especially in the areas of our lives that matter the most to us, such as our relationships. Um, skepticism is a starting point. It says, I want to know more before I settle on a belief. It's no guarantee of truthfulness, as we all know, but I think it is a good start. And that is where I will end. Um, actually, that, that was a plot. I was paid a hefty sum for that photograph of Joe Wilson. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Professor Richard Wiseman, uh, your opening remarks, please. Uh, thank you. Um, we'll try something sort of interactive um, here. I don't know if it'll work. Out. Um, hands up if you don't like joining in with things. <laughs> that was a joke. I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, no, we'll try something with everyone. Uh, so here's the thing. Uh, everyone just clasp your hands together and put one thumb over the other. Now, what we've just done is a little psychological test here. Keep your, your hands like that because you'll notice that one thumb is obviously on top of the other, and that's your natural way of laying your thumbs like that. If you, if you reverse your thumb, so for me, uh, the right-hand thumb is above the left one. If you reverse it the other way round, it kind of feels really weird. Really odd? Yeah? Okay, now put it back naturally. I don't want you all freaking out. So, um, 
So this simple little test tells us a huge amount about yourself, and it, it took less than a minute. <laughs> and, now, how are you applauding with your hands together like that? That's... <laughs> uh, so here's the thing. Uh, because the, uh, uh, each half of the brain controls the opposite side of the body, this tells us about uh, hemispheric uh, dominance. So if your right thumb is on top of your left thumb, you tend to be left hemispheric dominant. So you tend to be more rational, more skeptical, uh, more sequential uh, thinker. If it's the other way around, your right thumb, uh, sorry, your left thumb is on top, then you tend to be more uh, holistic and more associated with the arts, and it'd be surprising if there's many of you um, here today like that. <laughs> And if you are, you should leave. Um, so um, you can undo your hands. And, uh, so hands up if you think that was a pretty good test. Science in action. There we are. Fantastic. Right. Just, just the two of you uh, on, on there. Yes. And the, the two people that put their hands up for not enjoying joining in with things earlier on. So, um, uh, so this, is, this is kind of interesting. Um, why, why did I, I do that? Well, two reasons. Uh, first of all, I thought it would be kind of fun to do something interactive. And second, I'm quite short on material uh, in terms of what I'm actually going to talk about. <laughs> but um, what most people find is that if that classified you in the way you want to be classified, then people love the test. Oh, it's very insightful. Yes, yeah, I'm, a, I'm quite a rational person. <laughs> I particularly, don't like particularly it. you don't like oh, it. No. Okay, there we go. How, did you, how are you? How are you classified? Ah, there we go. There we go. As a as a right brain thinker, um, and uh, so um, so what's what's happening here is that people don't like the test if it doesn't classify them uh, the, the, the way they like to be seen. I think this is key uh, when it comes to to understanding why, why skepticism is, is so difficult, and that's something I'm going to return to a little bit later on. But let me let me start off with my my first um, point, which is actually a, an anecdote. Uh, about, oh, where are now? about 12 years ago, um, I decided to write a book uh, about skepticism and, and the paranormal. And so I wrote this treatment about all the different things I've been involved in. It was quite colourful with testing psychic dogs and going to India and looking at gurus and so on. And uh, I got myself a very good agent and we went all around the publishing houses uh, in London. And no one was interested in my book. We went to about 20 odd, odd publishing houses. No one. And the reason was... And they, they simply said, look, no one wants to hear that message. Nobody wants to hear these things are not true. If you're going to say they are true, then there's a big audience for it and we'll publish your book. <laughs> and of course that's the, the same message you hear from television um, producers as, as well. So that, my, my question is this, why do people not want to hear our message? What's the barrier that stands in the way, the psychological barrier? And I think the answer is pretty straightforward. Why do you go to a psychic? You go to a psychic to make yourself feel better. They're going to tell you something about yourself, normally positive. They say, don't worry about the future. It's going to be rosy and so on. Most people who go to psychics are concerned about something in their life, whether it's about relationship, financial worries, some sense of uncertainty. And the psychic gives them the certainty by saying, well, first of all, I can see into the future. And second, it's not going to be as bad as you think. Why do people go to mediums where they've lost a loved one? And the idea of just being able to communicate with that person, perhaps send one last message enormously sort of psychologically appealing. Why do you read astrology columns? Because the idea of that you're so special, that somehow the, the alignment of the stars tells you something about your life, psychologically very appealing. And then the skeptics come along. You know that person that makes you feel good, the psychic? Well, that's probably all Barnum statements. And the medium, the medium that kind of gave you some hope that your loved one could still receive a message from you, well, they're probably a fraud. And the astrology, it's true of one twelfth of the population, each of the star signs, don't be so gullible. And we wonder why we're not the most popular of uh, belief systems. <laughs> there is no mystery to it. Um, and, and so I, I would argue for utility. I would say that in order to understand, or if, if one wants to advance skepticism, if one wants to, to, to try and persuade people to be skeptics, then you have to think, what, what, what utility, what use does their belief system have, and how can scepticism somehow fill that vacuum? And if you look at the, the work on uh, psychology of belief and paranormal, there's been work looking at correlations with uh, intelligence, uh, with uh, creative thinking styles, all these things. And it's a very messy literature. I've, I've reviewed it in a few places, very messy. There is, however, one thing which does consistently um, uh, correlate with paranormal belief. And that is a traumatic childhood. So if your parents split up, 
or you're in an abusive uh, relationship with, with the caregiver, then that's a very good predictor of belief in the paranormal. And so as a child, you're facing uncertainty. You love the idea that someone could wave a magic wand and make it all better, and that's sticking with you as an adult. So we shouldn't demonize these paranormal believers. One of my worries about conferences like this, much as I love them, is that sometimes it is about demonizing us against them. You think we're kind of all in it together. And, and if you, you, you're going to have to understand where these people are coming from if you're going to try and reach out to them. So my call would be for skeptics to understand that their beliefs, these beliefs about the paranormal have utility. They provide purpose. It's not about whether they're true or whether they're false. I would love someone to say, you know, the reason I believe in, in psychic ability is that last paper published in Psychological Science last week. It doesn't happen. The reason they believe is because they've had an experience. It makes them feel better. It makes them feel in, in, in connected with, with others. So I, I think said, no, no, my own way of solving that was to go back to the publishers a few years later. And so I've got this idea. I've been studying lucky and unlucky people. And it turns out there is a psychology of luck. And if you understand how lucky people think and behave, then you can increase your luck. Now, suddenly, that's a skeptical message. I wasn't arguing anything magical going on. I was arguing it's entirely psychological, but suddenly it had utility. Suddenly it was a message that would make people feel good, that provided them with optimism, provided them with hope. And those 20 publishing houses that had turned us away with the skeptics book each went into a bidding war for the luck factor. And, and it's, it's sold all over uh, the world. So I, so I think it's, it's about understanding um, that, that issue. The second one, which has already been touched on to some extent, is what's meant by skepticism. I don't know if you told your friends that you were here today, um, which, which it seems um, you have some. Uh, but uh, <laughs> if you did, and they don't understand skepticism, how did, how did you go about describing this event? What do you say? I'm a skeptic. What's that mean? Well, um, how long have you got? Uh, and the best thing I ever heard somebody say was what it means that I look at the evidence before I make important decisions. What do you do? <laughs> so, um, that's an interesting tipping point there, because I thought if I waited long enough, uh, the applause would eventually, uh, so one of the two of us would get embarrassed first. Um, so, so I think it's very important that, that, that in, in terms of skepticism, we, we, we kind of, how, how do you describe to people what, what it is that, that we're doing? And when they do hear the word, it's associated with negativity, with, with the kind of saying everything's not true, and all those fun things like Santa Claus and, and so on, well, that's not true. So we need to change that, that, that um, yeah, sorry to break it to you in a group like this. Um, so, so we need to find a, a, a way to, and I think some of the, the sort of PR initiatives that are going on on the web and on TV and, and, and so on um, will, will help with that. Um, my third point is that uh, let us not be too down about skeptics. Really, I, I think sort of down, it's against us, nothing true, and we're never going to win, and all this sort of thing. Um, and I think we should know that there's a recent poll in the UK, 66%, I think it was, of teenagers now describe themselves as atheists in the UK. Huge. <laughs> Seventy percent as compulsive liars. <laughs> so no, no, they do. Sixty-six percent now describe themselves as atheists. I think there has been a sea change, and I think that's to do with books like *The God Delusion*, um, as, uh, as sold very well. Ben uh, Goldacre's uh, *Bad Science*, you know, uh, still uh, in the top ten in Amazon uh, in the UK. So, so I think there is something of a sea change. We shouldn't be too down uh, about it. I think people are shifting over to a more sceptical position. Um, and my final, final point is that maybe, I haven't actually said about the thumbs test, have we? I'll talk about that later. Um, my final point is that maybe we don't need that many skeptics. And this is the great thing. This is what I think is, is amazing about history of skepticism. Look back over the history of skepticism. How many people have we been putting into the public domain, even now? Yeah, you can probably count, you've got, you've got Randy, um, uh, Michael Shermer, uh, I don't know which, which other ones would, would, would come to mind, uh, but it's probably going to be less than 10 people that you see in the, 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 the public um, domain. It's always been like that. It's been a vanishingly small number of people. But look at what has been achieved with that. And why is that? I spoke to a, a television uh, producer, a friend of mine, who makes programs about the paranormal, sort of Arthur C. Clarke type things. And I said, why do you not have more skepticism on those programs? And she said, because we don't need it. She said, it's like kind of blowing up a balloon, trying to get people to believe this stuff. 
You have to huff and puff and really kind of blow all the kind of stuff in, and along come the skeptics, and they're like a pin. They just kind of burst it, and the whole thing goes away. You only need one skeptical comment to burst your balloon. And so my final thought with you is I'm very happy that when people look at people like us, we are described as a bunch of pricks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Before, before we start uh, going questions, I just wanted to make uh, a quick point. Um, there, there, we, some of the stuff that we're buzzing about back, backstage is, is the, the youth in this crowd tonight, uh, which is a fantastic thing. And Richard talked about uh, the, the teenage uh, atheist rate, as bad as that might sound, the teenage atheist rate in the UK. Um, some of the numbers that we're seeing in the US, uh, one of the studies that I recently read is between 18 and 29, a quarter of that segment is atheists are atheists, I'm sorry, in the United States. So we're a little bit behind the UK, but there, there is a, a, a growing you know, movement there. Um, and I think the other thing I would say that would echo what you were saying um, is that you know, we don't need to be Michael Shermer um, and you know, come up to the podium and say, I am a professional skeptic. I mean, everyone in this room is a skeptic, but they're journalists, they're scientists, or you know, they work at the local deli or bar. I mean, a anything, as long as you go forward in life, with that skeptical uh, cognitive you know, outlook, you can have an effect on society. So I'm uh, just kind of e echoing something, uh, some of the things that were, were said here. So let's go uh, to the questions. It looks like we have a, a pretty long uh, line forming at the back. Or, or are people just kind of scared to step up to the microphone? You can actually come out. I mean, I worked at Fox News, but I'm not that bad. I know you don't bite. There you go. Hello, my name is Rich. I'm a citizen of the Third Rock from the Sun. Um, I'm going to dig digress just a little bit. Uh, I'd like to hear more about who are the scientists who are great communicators. I think we'd all like to hear more about them. You mentioned Richard Dawkins, but I think Carl Sagan was, our, was one of the first and, and great uh, science uh, communicators. I think we all miss him. <clears throat> who, are, who, is the next, who, who are the next ones coming up? Tell us, tell us who you know. Somebody we can look to and say, hey, these are the guys. <laughs> this doesn't sound very good. Well, I think Steven Pinker is a fantastic communicator. <laughs> he, may not, he may not be addressing all the issues that people in the room would like to be hearing, but I think that the, thing, that the issues, um, the psychological issues and neuroscience that he does address is always extremely lucid and, um, you know, he gets my vote. Well, yeah. Yeah, Tyson is a good, is a good example. Um, there, are, there are a few. <laughs> there are a few, uh, but I think that the, the interesting question is not necessarily who they are, because either we know their names, yeah. you just go to the bookstore. Um, or, or turn on the television, or we will find out their names in the next few years. The, the really interesting question is, why are there so few of them? And I think that there's two answers, at least two answers to that question. One is that, contrary to what seems to be popular belief among academics themselves, there is absolutely no correlation between knowing a subject matter and being able to explain that subject matter to a lay audience. None. In fact, often I, I notice a negative correlation. The smarter you are, the more difficult it is for you to talk to other people at a level that they can understand. So that's question number one. Question number two is there's still a, despite uh, ample protestation to the country by deans and provosts and university presidents, there is a huge pressure on academics not to engage in public speaking and public writing. It doesn't get you tenure, it doesn't get you technical papers published, and it doesn't get you grants. And those are the only three things that matter. Teaching doesn't matter either, frankly, uh, unfortunately. So until we can manage to change that culture from the inside, I don't think you're going to see a lot more of the people that we're talking about. The good news is, and I, I'm going to take a um, page from your book and, and, and end up with a piece of good news, I guess. The good news is that the culture may be changing from the bottom up, and that's largely the result of blogging. 
there are so many of my colleagues who have started blogs and who suddenly enjoy it. They, they, they figured out that it's actually a good thing to talk to the public, they get good feedback, they enjoy doing it, they spend a significant amount of time doing it. Often they don't tell their department chairs that they're doing it, uh, but they are doing it. So I think that's going to change, but it's going to take a generation. Um, two, two quick points on that. One is that, of course, we shouldn't forget about, as you say, the sort of heroes from the past. And what's great about YouTube is, is the material is still out there. So James Burke and, and Connections, which I used to watch as a, a kid, um, is just a fantastic show. The whole of it is on YouTube uh, now. And it's still as good as it, as it was uh, then. So all that stuff is, is there in a way that, um, you know, it just wasn't a few years ago. In terms of finding um, the communicators of the future, in the UK, we have an um, com annual competition uh, called Fame Lab which is that uh, any PhD student can enter and they have three minutes to describe what it is they do uh, in the most kind of compelling way possible with demonstrations and so on. Uh, and they do this national heats all over the country, then there's a, a final at the Cheltenham Science Festival. Uh, the winner then has a contract with Channel 4 to present uh, on, on Channel 4 uh, and, and a cash prize to go with it. Everyone is filmed. And it means that television people, when they say we need a presenter who knows about chemistry, they can go to the Fame Lab archive and look at all the chemists and go, yeah, that person works for our show, let's get them in. So it's a very, very simple scheme. It's been extremely successful. And then presumably you could roll out the same sort of thing in the States. Thank you, Richard. Next question. Hey there. Um, my name is Steve Yerby. I come from Vermont, which some people call the Green Mountain State. You got some Vermonters. I call it the land of woo. I don't know if you know. <laughs> Um, I mean, I actually know someone who brought their cat to get acupuncture, so that's just, you know, it's just, it's just, um, and it's very difficult for me, and this is why this topic resonates with me so much, is it's difficult for me not to call people stupid, <laughs> you know, like when, when someone brings their cat to get acupuncture, that just rubs me the wrong way. So my, my um, I guess what I try to do is, I'm in sales first off, so I mean, I know not to call someone stupid, but I, it's important for me to, to use the finesse that it takes to communicate, Vanessa is an important word to me, to communicate what you're trying to get across to someone without calling them stupid. And what I want and what I seek out on a daily basis, listening to podcasts and coming to events like this, is requesting from thought leaders, from podcasters, for tools to communicate. Not just, you know, I mean, you're basically preaching to the choir here. We all have very similar thoughts. So what we need to take away from something like this and from podcasts and from educational facilities is the tools to communicate. So I think that's maybe what you're talking on today. How about critically challenged instead of stupid? Right, yeah. No, I, I, was, I was speaking in jest, but of course. Any comments from the panel or shall we? No, no, I have some thoughts on that. Um, absolutely right. I mean, what's weird about um, that ar the argument, the sort of woo argument, that you shouldn't be skeptical, is that it's so compartmentalized. Because could you imagine going to buy a used car and you go, oh, I'm not interested in the evidence. You know, this one feels right. <laughs> <laughs> or a pilot, you know, kind of go, oh, don't worry about all the dials, you know, leave it to intuition. <laughs> and, and any of the, 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 the woos, as it were, um, will accept those arguments. They, they will be critical thinkers in certain contexts. It's only within the paranormal context, often only in the paranormal, they're not. So it's a question of understanding that, that comp uh, uh, the way it's a comp compartmentalize uh, things. Sorry, jet lag. Um, so in five hours time, you'll find this far more engaging than it is uh, at the moment. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, but you're absolutely right. And in, in terms of engaging with individuals, I think if someone's made up their mind, they're a real strong proponent of, of whatever it is, you're not gonna reach them. You're gonna get, it's gonna get nasty, and you're gonna probably lose a friend, and you've got right. to decide whether you wanna lose that friend. And I, <laughs> I probably would always come down and keep the friendship and, and, and stay away from the argument. However, there's a very large percentage of people, if you're a party, um, who won't be decided one way or the other, and they are your audience. And it's a question of trying to be likable, engaging, charismatic, and all those things we know actually sway people, rather than the evidence. Um, because what we do is when we're pr uh, presented with a huge amount of evidence, we go, that's ah, too much. What's the person like? Do they seem to be quite a pleasant person who's presenting this? Because if so, I'll go with them. <laughs> uh, and lots of psychological studies showing that. So it's one of the reasons why charismatic politicians um, like to bombard you with evidence. Because then you go, too much. Oh, you seem quite a nice person. I'll just believe you. So, so I do think we need to think about the social factors there, not just keep it about evidence. It's about, can I present myself as a likable person? Because that will persuade people far more than three peer-controlled publications. Peer reviewed publications. 
I'd like to add something to follow up on, on that. Um, in my previous life, I, I lived at the university, near the University of Tennessee in, in Knoxville, and um, that was a whole different cultural experience from New York, as you might imagine. One of the parts of that cultural experience was occasionally doing debates with creationists, which hasn't happened since I moved to New York. Don't know why. But one of the things that happened that was very interesting to me, um, and it happened consistently, is that the, the most uh, frequent sort of feedback that I got from the audience, from members on the, of the audience that were on the other side of the video, you know, from creationists, was, well, I didn't realize that evolutionary biologists can be nice people. <laughs> I mean, these people literally thought that I was going to show up. they never seen a scientist in their lives. Okay? That I was going to show up with this, you know, horns on my head and breathing fires, eating kids and things of that sort. And once they found out that was not the case, and that in a few, at least in a few instances I was more pleasant than their champions, um, that sort of created kind of the dissonance. Well, you know, this, this seems like a reasonably nice guy, so why is it that he's supposed to go to hell? Now, they'll send me to hell anyway, but it, it's, it was an interesting observation. And, and where do those perceptions come from? Why, I mean, we probably have some interaction with scientists, so we, we don't rely on the stereotypes, but most people don't have that. So where's that, that, that stereotype movies. come from? from? From the movies, that's evil scientists out to ruin the world. Um, and if you don't get any negative information to disconfirm that, that's what you end up believing. You know, at the same time, uh, I th I'm very happy this came up. At the same time, I think that there are some scientists who do communicate to the public, but they do it in a way in which might not be the most friendly. It, it comes across as, as a little arrogant and strident. And so, if those Does are the people... anybody in mind? No. <laughs> if those are the people that are out there, though, uh, getting science across to the public, then those are the people that the people that we're trying to get to, they're hearing those people. They're not hearing Massimo, Richard Wiseman, you know, uh, come to talk give a public lecture locally. So uh, that might be another reason why they have stereotypes like that. Um, have a comment? No. I, thought, I thought you did. Okay. We'll go to the next question. All right. And thank you for the term appropriate skeptic, by the way. I like that. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. That was a good one. Uh, hello. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm uh, Daniel, and I run a small get-together called the Jolly 13 Club, which happens to be meeting up tomorrow in uh, Vero Midtown, which is very close by. Everybody's um, invited? Yes, everybody's invited. It is a lot of fun. Uh, Vero Midtown, if you want more information, um, see me outside afterwards. I'm not going to be wasting people's time. But I would like to ask one question. How do you keep your cool when you talk to somebody that's a fundamentalist believer in complete nonsense? Um, um, it's genetics. <laughs> so I have no hope. Now, actually, it's, no, that is an interesting question because um, one of the other interesting experiences that I had debating creationists is that I was actually expecting them to be much more aggressive. And I'll, the overwhelming majority of the people that I met were very, very nice to me. They were really generally disturbed by the topic, by the subject matter, but they were very nice to me. In only one case, I felt physically threatened by this guy that after the debate came really very close to me. And he pointed his finger at me and said, you know, the only reason I'm not blowing your brain off is because there is a God. And I said, in that case, keep believing. <laughs> very quick thoughts on that. Um, one is that uh, I, I suppose some of the people that I, I deal with because I test psychics and so on are knowing, known frauds. I think they know exactly what they're about and, and it's very difficult to keep you cool with that because you just know that they're exploitative, uh, exploitative horrible people. Um, but most of them actually are uh, quite sincere in their beliefs and so we tested one for the, the JREF um, challenge quite recently who'd, who'd come along saying look you know I can read people I, I can look at them and tell them all about their past and you think, well, why do you think you can do that? He said, well, for 20 years, that's what I've done. People have come in, I've told them about their past, and they said, yes, that's accurate. Well, yeah, you've never tested yourself, but it's perfectly real. I understand why you've got that, that belief. Um, and, and in the test, you didn't do very well, and, and, and it's a question of, of trying to be supportive and, and trying to... Because know this, if you are taking away people's beliefs, and, and that's central to their identity and how they're going to live their life and provide them with optimism and hope and so on, if you do not um, replace it with something which is equally... Uh, supportive, you're going to have a problem. 
Uh, and you don't want people flipping from one extreme uh, to, to another. So think about what's going to happen when you take somebody when it's absolutely central to their identity that these things are true, and you rob them of all of that. You know, what's, what's good about your worldview? What, what's going to come in its, in its place? I think that's a very important issue. Uh, so so I, I think for most part when I'm talking to people like that, I sort of think, well, actually, I don't agree with you, but I understand how you've got to that position. And, and sometimes I think, you know, what, what is the difference between us? Is it genetics, if that's, that's not your fault? Is it child, uh, child upbringing? Well, that's not your fault. Did you go to a different school to me? Well, that's not your fault. I mean, what, what, what makes it your fault? It's just we disagree, and we just have a conversation about it, and it's just two humans chatting about it. So it's just trying to avoid being combative, really. Next question. Okay, hi everybody. My name is uh, Simon, and I come come from a small town in the north of Sweden called Umeå. Uh, so I've travelled a bit to Thank get you, here. And uh, just have it ahead. Thank you. Uh, I, I've actually got got a question concerning the the or, or re relating to the title of of, of the, this panel uh, on on. on why it is so hard to be a skeptic. And uh, I, I, back, back in Umeå, I have a quite, quite close friend who, 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 who is a true Christian believer. She really believes in, in the Bible, she takes it literally, and is really hardcore Christian. So I, I, I've talked with her a couple of times, or, or quite, quite, quite many times actually, and, and, and we've discussed on and on about the Bible versus science versus blah, blah, blah yada, yada, yada. And it, it, it just feels like I'm, I'm getting nowhere and, and I can't see any idea in keeping up with this. And, and I, I've talked to, to, to her and her, her, her belief is so strong for her. It, it means so much. And, and she, she said that without it, she wouldn't be the same person. She, now she's really kind and outgoing and happy and stuff and, 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 and she, she said that if, if she didn't believe that there, there, there was a God and, and a meaning, she wouldn't be the same person. So I, 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 I feel like I can't take that away from her. And I, 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 I've, I, 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 I kind of feel bad for not believing in, in, in the same thing as her, but, but at, at the same time I'm really sure that, 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 that I'm right as well. So it, so it's really a tough strange. situation, right? Okay, yeah. all right. So, um, so what do you do? Is it worth pursuing well, it? Yeah, I think Richard had kind of talked about this before. You have to kind of hedge your bets and wonder if it's worth yeah. having that conversation with her or just kind of saying, well, this one's off the table and let's move on with our friendship. I've just got this image somewhere. There's another conference going on full of Christians and your friend is standing there going, my friend is a skeptic. I, I can't do anything <laughs> about it. Um, <laughs> So I, I, you know, the, the, you know I, I find it sort of odd that you kind of go, you know, she's happy, she's outgoing, she's successful, you know, it's almost like you've missed the end of the sentence, which is really bloody annoying because she's a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so I, I think the answer is, you know, how, do you, how much do you treasure your friendship? You know, two people can be friends and not agree about everything. There are things you, you can agree to disagree on and that's how you get along. You don't, you don't need to be agreeing about absolutely, it'd be really boring if we all agreed about uh, you know, everything. So, you know, celebrate the diversity, or if you can't do that, then that's the end of your friendship. But I don't think it's, there should be this need to convert, but that's it's just my point of view. I, I think I'll go with, with the first choice there, actually. Okay. Thank well, you, Richard. I have, um, I have a slightly different take, take on First of all, yeah, you're right, there is probably, a in fact, many, many more conferences of Christians arguing, um, you know, wondering the same thing. But of course, the fundamental difference is that we are probably right. Yeah, that's right. They're probably wrong. <laughs> um, but, but, but there is a, there is a the couple of things, uh, comments that I wanted to make about that particular story. The first one is, of course, that you probably don't have, it, there is no question of you convincing her anyway. It's not like you actually have the power to convince her. When somebody is that far, uh, away from, from sort of critical thinking. A skeptic is not the person to talk to. But if, if there is any possibility that she's gonna start questioning her beliefs, that will come from talking to other people who are almost as extreme as she is, and yet that disagree enough that her preacher is gonna tell them that they're going to hell. 
And that will generate cognitive dissonance for her. And we'll say, wait a minute, these are all Christians. They all believe almost the same thing that I believe. And yet, because my church has music and theirs doesn't, they're going to go to hell. That's what's going to cause the first breach in her system, not a skeptic full front assault. So I wouldn't do a full front assault to begin with. However, the part where I'm going to disagree in, in part, I guess, with, with you is this. And here's the, the sort of the philosopher in me talking. It is true that, of course, if you have to make a choice between friendship and, and you know, confronting the, the person head on on a belief, it could be any kind of belief, not just necessarily, not necessarily religious, then you have to make a choice and you have to, to, to see, well, how much do I value that friendship? However, there is also such a thing as a, what I would call a moral duty toward truth. And I'm not mean truth with the capital T. I mean the best truth that we can get at and so on and so forth. In philosophy, this is known as the, the red pill versus blue pill <laughs> alternative, right? Uh, after the matrix. And to me, that, that actually does come, become an ethical question. That is, I think we have within limits an ethical duty as skeptics to defend and pursue the truth as best that we understand it. Um, that doesn't mean you have to confront every other person on the planet, for one thing, because there's too many of them. And second, because you still want some friends left at the end of the day. Um, but I think that there is, in fact, a, a, an ethical component to it that I would not completely discard, because that is an important part of the reason why we're doing this. Um, there are, as we heard this morning, there are consequences of gullibility. There are sometimes lethal consequences of like, gullibility, and so it, it is an ethical question as well. Uh, Massimo, if I could just a ask you uh, a follow-up there. Would you say that then if you had a friend that believed in something so extreme, there might be something in this moral duty toward truth to not be friends?